express. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we begin this week's final study, shall we come before our Heavenly Father and thank Him for the many blessings of our study and our conversations this week? and ask for his guidance in this, which we are about to study. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you today, we're, we are reminded of all of the blessings that you have presented for us this week. And we thank you for these blessings and for the blessings that you are providing for us today. The biggest blessing that you are providing is this of your word. You are showing us, Father, how much you care. You are showing us the paths that are before us and reminding us that you will be there to guide us. Help us now, Father. Help our faith so that we may truly understand <clears throat> that which you would have us to do. I thank you for each one that are joining into these meetings today. I ask, Father, for your blessing upon them all. Direct us now. Be with us. May your angels attend us. May your spirit be with us. Thank you for this time help us so that we may more properly show your character to all with whom we come in contact for this we thank you and praise you in jesus name amen, amen. <clears throat> okay now we have the final five chapter or final five verses of judges nine before us we began discussing yesterday that a certain woman cast a piece of millstone upon Abimelech's head and all to break his skull. So this was so that these, these men and these women that are trapped in this tower can then be finished with the mistake of selecting Abimelech as a ruler that was brought upon them by the men of Shechem and by the house of Milo, which was the, the ruling house of Shechem. Then he called hastily unto the young man, his armor bearer, and said unto him, draw thy sword and slay me, that men say not of me, a woman slew me. And his young man thrust him through and he died. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man unto his place. Now, the men of Shechem, the men of the cities around this had selected Abimelech as their king. Nowhere does it say that the men of Judah or Benjamin or Simeon had selected him. But here it says, and when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man into his place. So why is the, there a, a generalization being made that the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead? What representation can we draw from this? Well, I mean, if we're going to apply it to this movement, then the men of Israel would be the people outside of this movement in Adventism. Okay. That's the way I would see it. That's okay. The last two verses bring us full circle 
to the prophecy of Joseph. Thus God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech, which he did unto his father, in slaying his seventy brethren. <clears throat> and all the evil of the men of Shechem did God render upon their head, and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubal. So now we are looking that this <clears throat> ends this message to the movement and to the church. Any other thoughts on what we've, what we've been reading here? Okay. Now, as we, as we progress, <clears throat> we're now coming into Judges chapter 10. I would have to ask is if this chapter of judgment is a judgment chapter, since 10 is a symbol of judgment. We have several new things introduced and new people introduced. Tola judgeth Israel, and after him, Jair, whose 30 sons had 30 cities. The children of Israel fall again into idolatry and are oppressed by the Philistines and the Amorites. They cry unto God and are sent by him for help unto their false gods. Upon their repentance, he pitieth them. They assemble and consult about choosing a head. Why is it that so many times through this type of history, we are seeing that the children of Israel at this time were more concerned of choosing a leader rather than allowing God to lead? Why is it <clears throat> that we see in our history the same thing has occurred many times within the church and within the movement? And what messages can we take from this of Tola and Jair and the decisions of the children of Israel? Now, and after Abimelech, there arose to deliver Israel, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, <clears throat> a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shemir in Mount Ephraim. And he judgeth Israel 20 and three years and died and was buried in Shemir. <clears throat> now, one symbol that we can take out of this Tola judged Israel 23 years. So, would we apply that as being a symbol of the 2300 day prophecy? Well, I would think so. Um, yeah, so we also have with this, so 23 years happens to be 84,001 days. Okay. Which, which is an interesting number, 84,000. Um, of course, it has the one added, so it's not perfectly a round number, but it's pretty close. Um, and we know 84 is 7 times uh, 12. You have that one extra day. So, so twenty three hundred, uh, or twenty three years, obviously can relate to the twenty three hundred days as the symbol, since it's got that number twelve times seven that uh, connects to uh, the prophetic mirror and the seventy weeks and all those different structures. 
it's also and it's it's kind of interesting too because of <clears throat> what we're going to see in a couple of the the following verses. So this is all that we're told at this point about Tola. What does the name Tola mean? Um, well, it means and strong is in the or worm, right? A worm. Um, and I know it's got a good connotation, but I forget which. Well, it's interesting that, that we're being shown three generations of this judge. Why would it be important that we understand these three generations? We're in the fourth. We want to know what came before us, why we got to where we are. Well, I mean, what we're, what we're told about the second generation, they knew not what happened with the first, and the third did not know what happened with the, the first and the second, and by the time you get to the fourth, they knew nothing about anything. So this could be taking us to Joel 1, then? Very possible. Palmer worm and so forth. Yeah, poor, one of the meanings is splendid. Be beautiful, be splendid. Okay, and then we have the son of Dodo. Dodo means means loving or amatory. I mean, I'm sure there are more meanings, but this is what I found. And Shamir is like a precious stone or a flint stone. And then it had, there's a lot of Arab guys with that name. So it must refer to Islam also. It could have an impl implication with Islam. But did you not say that Tola means a worm? Mm hmm Worms are not normally looked upon as being leaders. Yeah, and in this case, it, it's more like a maggot. Oh, really? Okay. Like, a grub, like a grub or something like that, not an earthworm. So we have a maggot the son of splendor and you said dodo was was loving yeah okay so psalm 23 where david is taking the part of christ and doesn't he say i am a worm and no man so could this be talking about christ who descended from heaven to take the worm-like being on earth all right well, this would be somebody, or this is a message that recognizes the weakness of human nature. Well, I, I find the, the combination here with the 23 years as representative of the 2300 days to be very interesting because what does the glory of Christ do for man well it it prepares it, it, and it, he can stand in the judgment does it not lay the glory of man in the dust yeah mm -hmm. oh, man. okay So we are told that he judged Israel 20 and three years and died and was buried in Shamir. And after him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel 20 and two years. So additively, these two judges would be said to have judged Israel for 45 years. Mm -hmm. 45 being a number that we see on the 1843 chart very prominently. But 22 is also a number of 
restoration. So would this would these two symbols, the 2300 and 22, would they be pointing to us the importance of understanding the overall symbols because they bring us into a restored communion with Christ? One of the things I've, I've had to look at several times is how important is the 2300 days when you're comparing this also with the seven times. And the difference, of course, between the two is 220. Right, and here you have the 22. So this would represent to me, you take the 22, if that's 220 years and right. 2300 and you add them together, you get the 2520. Exactly. So these two judges, are they a symbol of what has happened in the movement in coming to understand more clearly the 2300 days and the seven times that you cannot have one without the other because if you try to separate the two you miss out on the blessing of the restoration of true worship Okay. And he had 30 sons that rode on 30 ass colts, and they had 30 cities, which are called Havoth Jair unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. Now, here we are shown that Jair was the son of Manasseh. And in Numbers 32, 41, they went and they took the small towns thereof and called them Havoth Jair. Yet in this verse, you have 30 sons, 30 being the age when a priest was allowed to begin serving. And they rode on 30 ass colts. So are we looking at this as being Islam? Or is the symbol of the ass colt here the symbol of those that would properly show the character of Christ, just as he rode on the colt of an ass into Jerusalem? How are we to look at this? Well, I, I would take, um, I mean, we have this 30. So, so we know that 30 shows up as periods of 30 years. Here, it's, it's not going to be 30 years because it's going to be 22 years. But we know that we looked at the chart yesterday of Stephen's um, with uh, periods of 30 years. <clears throat> exactly. And, and so we have here three periods or three numbers of 30, right? So 30, 30, and 30, 30 sons, 30 ass colts, 30 cities. And um, in a sense, this is a type of line upon line. Right. So to me, they must be representing something that is, um, we need to know what the 30 sons represents, the 30 ass colts and the 30 cities. Uh, which are called uh, the villages of Jair, Havath Jair. And um, I, 
I, I would say it, it these represent messages. But does it also not represent a people that is prepared to give a message? Yeah, but I'm just saying the number 30 would represent the message connected with the 30 years. That is the 30 years in our time period. So it, the, the 30 so it goes back to the foundation of, of what this message is. Okay. <clears throat> So, you know, the 22 years, we also have that in the story of Joseph. Right. Which is connected to this message, particularly um, our part in this message with July 18th, because July 18th is connected to uh, the story of Joseph. Um, the, not everybody's completely aware of that because, you know, we look at Ezekiel and Revelation 9, but July 18th, couldn't really have resulted without an understanding of the story of Joseph. I would say very much. Yeah. Um, now there's also a connection between these two. So you have these two different judges, right? Tola and Jair. Um, now, it's interesting that the one is from Issachar, and uh, how would how we understood the the, uh, the symbol of Issachar so far? Well, it's everybody may not remember that. Uh, something to do with the ass, and it's and it's a, a hired hired servant. Okay. Anything else? Well, I'm looking at this again, just. So, so yeah. you have an ass that, that carries a burden. Right. It, it couches down between two burdens. It, it's unable, even though it's a strong ass, it's, uh, there's a burden that's put upon it that's difficult for it to bear. Okay. So, because remember, we had Zebulun. Zebulun was connected... Because we, I'm, I'm thinking back to the numbering of the tribes. Right. Right. So Zebulun had that number 57,400 that went from the founding of Adventism to July 18, 2020. And then we also addressed the numbering of Issachar. So, uh, and Zebulun and Issachar were the two tribes that um, were connected to Gideon, right? Right. So, so when we looked at Issachar, uh, let me see if I can find it here. Uh, was it Issachar, Zebulun, and Issachar? So find next. Um, I can't find it here. For some reason, I can't find it on the slide. The slides. Um, now that was Zebulun and Naphtali. Right. And then Issachar was connected with um, uh, so Issachar. Oh yeah, that was the one what I did with Issachar. So with Issachar, I had connected it to July 18, 1870. 
um, and if I counted the 54,400 days uh, for Numbers chapter 1, it would bring me to uh, February 22nd, 2024. And that's going to be uh, that date, February 22nd, 2024, is a symbolic date. And it's the number of days, uh, if you use the number of from Judah in Numbers 26, it goes from September 11th, 1814 to February 22nd, 2024. So Judah and Issachar create these symbols between September 11 and July 18 um, that connect us to this symbolic date of February 22. So there's a lot more to it. Um, but when we look at the these two, uh, when we look at Judah, um, Judah is this lion, right? Right. And Issachar is the ass. And so then how did we connect that? He's the strong ass couching down between two burdens. So uh, first Kings 12, right? Or first Kings 13, one or the other. I think it's first Kings 13. Yeah, it's first Kings uh, chapter 13. Right, so that's going to be the story of the disobedient prophet. All right, so we had gone through that a little bit, um, dealing with that. So you're going to have this lion and this ass. So what are these two representing then? Well, in the story of the disobedient prophet, isn't that disobedient prophet slain by the lion? Yep, the disobedient prophet slain by the lion, but the lion doesn't eat either the carcass of the disobedient prophet or kill the ass. Right. So is that lion representative of the 144,000? Well, are we going to connect it, that to messages? I mean, in, in the context of the disobedient prophet has a message. His message is uh, the prophecy of Josiah. And we can see that the prophecy of Josiah is the prophecy of Revelation chapter 9. Okay. Right? And, right. and we, we have connected these all together in our prediction of July 18. So we have the message of Gideon, and then we have this message of Abimelech. But after Abimelech, we're going to have two different judges that are going to be mentioned that connect to be 45 years, one being 23 years and one 22 years. And, and the symbols here we have in the one uh, – uh, Tola, he's going to be a man of Issachar. So he's going to be connected to the message of uh, the ass, right? And then we're going to have the next one, Jair, who's a Gileadite. Um, so he would be of the tribe of Manasseh, I believe, based upon right. uh, all the information here. And um, he's going to have 30 sons that ride on 30 ass colts, and, that, the, and they have 30 cities, which are the villages of Jair, which are in the land of Gilead, right? So, so these must be two different messages, messages connected to the prophecy of Islam, back to the July 18, 2020 prediction. But we know that that prediction failed. But this message still carries on under these two judges. Wouldn't that be reasonable conclusion? I I'm not <clears throat> I'm not disagreeing that that would be reasonable. Mm -hmm. So in having this.
in placing these messages in this way. The lion kills the, the false prophet who is not doing as he was instructed by the Lord. Mm -hmm. So his message, would we say that the, the message was a, a false message or just his, his outcome was a false message? Well, the message was correct because we know the message was fulfilled. Right. That is, it's the prophecy of Josiah. So a disobedient prophet can give a correct message but he must follow everything that is laid out before him and follow this to the letter. Mm -hmm. but, this, but the symbols there of the lion and the ass, um, I mean, the lion can represent different things. Sure. I mean, it can represent Babylon, it can represent Christ, it can represent Satan. Can represent Judah. They can represent, yeah, the tribe of Judah itself. Though, in a sense, the tribe of Judah being a line is symbolic in and of itself. But, um, and then the ass can represent uh, different things, but primarily we find it connected to Islam. And and so we have a message about Babylon, and we have a message about Islam in this movement. And here with the representation of the 30, we have we have some other things that have to be blended in with this. Well, yeah, and the 30 to me would represent this movement, just like it would represent the 30 years of Joseph or the 30 years of Christ. But here is a symbol. It's 30 and it's times three, which is uh, representing the third angel's message. Now, you know, we know that our message uh, began in um, November 9th, 1989, and we have the 30 years ending in uh, 2019. But we also know that we have 30 years from December 25th, uh, 1991 to December 25th, 2021, right? Correct. That is, we often look at the 30 years but that 30 years is has a period of time that begins at a period of 777 days and a period of time that ends at 777 days. Right? Agreed. So, you know, so, so the movement, in a sense, became 30 at the end of those 777 days. Now that's that's an intriguing application. Mm -hmm. So, so um, and then we can see that there is the thirty sons. So, what would sons represent? And here it's just the normal name Ben for sons. So why do we have 30 sons, 30 ass cults, and 30 cities? What are these representing? Well, in the Millerite history, we had 300 that proclaimed the message, right? Yeah. So would those 300 be looked upon as being sons of Miller's message? Okay. Well... Yeah, definitely, to me, this is sons of a message, right? So it's the sons of that 30. Does that make sense? I would agree. Okay. And, and they have the message of Islam. And remember, when Jeff first marked... Um, uh, you know, the time of the end, he was marking it with the fall of the Soviet Union, which which was, of course, correct, but he was connecting that to August 11th, 1840. 
even though that was about Islam. And it, it took time to switch that to uh, September 11th, 2001. But we can see that Jeff's message always had that August 11th, 1840 aspect to it. Right. The message of Islam, of the trumpets. Now, what about the 30 cities? And and here, um, they're, they're using the word for cities, but later on they're going to be called villages of Jair. But it's A-R here is the word for city. I'm, what intrigues me about this is the, the prophetic application because Numbers 3241 occurs before they are crossing into the promised land. And now we're coming back to it in Judges 10. Yeah, and, and so that... I'm just going to go there. So numbers 32, 41. It's, it's right in front of us on the screen. Yeah, I know, but I want to look at the context. Okay. Um, yeah, so Moses gave Gilead, this is the verse before, unto Maker, the son of Manasseh, and he dwelt therein, right? So we can see being a Gileadite, he's also uh, from the tribe of Manasseh. Right. And here, the son of Manasseh, took the small towns thereof and called them Hobath Jair. Um, so this Jair here is, is this the same person is what I'm asking. I mean, cause saying he's the son of Manasseh doesn't mean necessarily he's like the direct descendant, obviously because Manasseh was a long time ago. So he's of the tribe of Manasseh. Right. Uh, but is this the same GR? Well, it's kind of interesting that there would be two, but I mean, it's possible. <clears throat> but yeah, I, th I think it's, I mean, I think it's most likely the same person, at least that's whether this is when it talks about JR, the, the son of Manasseh went and took the small towns thereof. I mean, in numbers, it could be referring to something that happens later, possibly, or, um, but it, it just seems kind of odd that you, you have this here. So, cause if it is the same person, this would be talking about something that happened much later, but it would right. be placed in the book of numbers, right? Correct. Um, so either there's two JRs in two different times that basically have the same thing happen, or it's the same person just mentioned sort of out of context context in the book of numbers in like chronological context. See, the, the prophetic implication would mean that this message of Jair had to be repeated. Yeah. I mean, aren't we, aren't we living in a time where the first and the second angel's message are having to again be repeated for the people to understand? So we're, we're at the same yeah. type of situation as were the Millerites prior to 1844. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we are told that Anjair died and was buried in Kaman. What is the meaning of Kaman? It means elevation. Um, and, you know, this comes from a word, which means to rise, kum. So that's that word um, that we have two different ways, uh, sir and kum. Right. That refer to lifting <clears throat> up or taking away. Right. Uh, so they're related. Uh, <clears throat> right.
and and you see that in the name Jehoiakim is this word uh, kum. Okay. So anyway, if that's helpful for people. Sure. Now, Judges 10, 6. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Zidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the children of Ammon and the gods of the Philistines and forsook the Lord and served not him. Okay, I, I want to go back here. Okay, that's fine. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to understand here what, um, so, you know, we're obviously going to have these people die. So it's going to tell us about the judge. Right. You know, these judges that arrive after, arise after Abimelech. Um, they're going to give who they are, their genealogy, um, and the period in which they judge, and then where they're going to be buried. They don't really tell us anything about what was happening. No, they give very sketchy information. Yeah. Now, and we have um, the, so and these are in different territories. So we have uh, Tola and G at Tola is going to be, um, uh, he dwells in Mount Ephraim in Shamir, right? Um, so that's going to be, um, you know, in the tribe of Ephraim. That's going to be in, in on the west side of the Jordan. And then you're going to have on the east side of the Jordan, you're going to have this other one, Jair. And um, so it talks about where uh, – He's from Gilead, but he has these 30 sons who dwell in these 30 cities. And then they're going to tell us where he was buried, which is in Kamen. Now this, uh, um, so uh, I'm just going to try to go here. So when you're dealing with this, um, this root, this word, kum, um, that's going to be, just hang on a bit here. Um, that's going to occur in Daniel. And it's going to, um, let's see if I can find it here quickly. There's so many different ways this word is translated, but I just don't know if which form it occurs in Daniel. Um, Oh, I don't see it. Must be the different form of the word. Ah, that's why. Yeah, it's in Daniel, and that's because it's in Aramaic. <laughs> All right. Um, so you see it in Daniel 6, verse 1, and Daniel 6, 3. Um, um, it means establish. Anyway, when we deal with Jehoiakim, his, his name is connected to this kum, and Jehoiachin is connected to uh, kon. Uh, kon. Um, so these are these two different Hebrew words which are often translated as place. So in, I know I'm, I'm taking sort of a roundabout way to kind of, uh, to, um, 
let me see here. So, yeah, it's related to the Hebrew word in, in Daniel 8 11, where it talks about the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And, and that word is makon, um, which is related to Jehoiachin's name. And it means they haven't translated his place, but it's a foundation, right? And the idea here is that we have, there's two, it's two different ways for words for foundation. Um, you have one that can refer to the place of a pagan sanctuary and one that can refer to uh, a place of God's sanctuary. And so here in... Um, in Judges, I think the, the significance of where he is buried is that he's buried in this, this place, right? An elevation or some place that is raised up or established. So this is the foundation of this message, is the roundabout way that I'm trying to go. <laughs> I, I hope people could follow that sort of uh, path that I was going on. It, it's not really complete, but but do you get the idea? There's something here, yeah. Yeah. So, so the first ones, um, and and even with the Shamir, I mean, I'm not really totally satisfied with um, the the definition of it because it does. Um, refers to like the pricking of a thorn um, um, but it also is related to the word observed so it's kind of hard to know what um, you know so the pricking of a thorn also from the scratching of a gem probably a diamond or an adamant stone or a briar. So what would that refer to to this mess? Because what I want to do is try to distinguish these two messages, what they are. Because we have these two judges in this period of 45 years, the 23 and the 22, and these come after the death of Abimelech. So what would they be referring to? What are these two messages? Uh, regarding the thorn, I, I didn't find that when I did a search, but I'll take your word for it. Like God said, if you were to unite or get close to the heathen tribes around you, they would be like a thorn in your side and in your eyes. So it's an annoyance. It's an ongoing pestilence. Yeah. Or like a prick from a thorn or a point or the scratching uh, from made by a diamond or an adamant stone right so so that's going to be shamir and then the other one is going to be this place of his sanctuary can we connect this to any specific messages i mean we know this is still kind of future but it is based on something in the past thinking of christ our high priest in the sanctuary okay so this, this is the message of what? I mean, could we connect this to the message of, of the cross? The message of the 70th week again? Could have something, something to do with the daily too, how the priest, how the priest, how the mainstream church has massacred the daily. Okay, because as Dwight pointed out, you know, we have the 2520 represented here with the 22 and the 23 and its connection, like the 2300 days and the 2520. We have the symbol of this movement in the 30 and we have this, this aspect of the fourth generation um, and we have the prophecy of Islam. 
I mean, can we define what this message is? I think we're going to have to look at this since, I mean, our, our application on Abimelech was that this is a false third angel's message. Okay. Now, either that application that I presented is incorrect or it is correct. If it is correct, then is this series of messages, these two judges, being part of the preparation for giving the third angel's message. Or is it just the third angel's message? Right, but don't we have to be prepared in order to give that message? Yeah. We can recognize from what Mrs. White wrote in the 1888 time frame that this message in its purity has never been given. Mm -hmm. But we know Tola is a person, it represents a people or a message that sees itself as a worm. But right. it is the son of um, uh, the splendid right right and, and the son of the loving right and a man of issachar so it has a message dealing with this the message of the ass but also it's a burden bearer right but this this is one it's a burden bearer but it is crouched between two burdens right so we have at this point the burden of July 18th, which is related again to Islam. Mm -hmm. But we also have the burden of the third angel's message. Mm -hmm. That would be a way of looking at this. Yeah. Okay. So and now, if are we going to take these, these two messages as... Now... So one of the things here is we know that we have Tola and Jair. There's these two different judges. And it says one judge is, you know, 23 years and one 22. We can't add them to be 45. But these are in different locations. Are we to understand that they happen successively or are they contemporary with one another? I would think they're contemporary. I would think so, too. That after Abimelech, you're going to have... In the land of Gilead, you're going to have Tola. In the land of, or, or the other way around, the land of Ephraim, you're going to have Tola. In the land of Gilead, you're going to have Jair. So there's these, but to me, this represents the message, the messages that are going to happen after the death of Abimelech, after the death of this other message. Ellen White, she mentions Tola and Jair. Okay. And the way she says it, the way I, I get it from what she's writing. There's like, uh, yes. yes. Okay. Okay, so. But, you know, it's, it's interesting, too. What we're looking at here. Yeah, she says uh, Tola governed Israel 23 years and was succeeded by Jair. Okay. And I know Stephen studied the chronology of the judges much more than I have. Yeah, he's, he's done a, a wonderful presentation on that with tabled history. Yeah, and also um, it's in the Signs of the Times, 1874. Um, well, that's what it's called. That's when it, um, this is actually, it's written in August 11th, 1881. 
uh, today's August 11th. Um, yep. um, so, so we can then connect this message to the message of Islam of August 11th, 1840. Now, isn't that an interesting symbol to, to consider? Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, now, of course, this is where she writes it. Uh, it's also in the SDA Bible commentary, but again, it's just taken from the August 11th, 1881 article. So this is the only place that I have on the disc that Ellen White refers to Tola and J. Here. Right. Could we say that <clears throat> being the sixth and, and the seventh judges could mean a lot too? man's number and god's number us coming out of our fleshliness so to speak and becoming holy i mean that's the ideal to we were to strain for Now, this is interesting. So the paragraph before that, Ellen White says, um, she's talking here about um, uh, Abimelech, you know, earlier on. And remember, we had looked at the August um, 4th, 1888, 1881 article. And I said we should read the August 11th, 1881 article, which right. I didn't. I didn't follow my own advice. Um, <laughs> and why didn't you? As, I read it, but I forgot until now, Theodore. Yeah, I just, I just don't have, a, I don't have a good excuse. Um, but anyway, here she's talking about this, and then she talks about um, the the need of devotion and humility. She says devotion. And so I'm going back a few more paragraphs. Devotion and humility have ever characterized the men with whom God has entrusted important responsibilities for in his work. The divine call to Moses in the desert found him distrustful of self. He realized his unfitness for the position which God had called him, but having accepted the trust, he became a polished instrument in the hand of God to accomplish the greatest work ever committed to mortals. Had Moses trusted in his own strength and wisdom and eagerly accepted the great charge, he would have evinced his event against his entire unfitness for such a work. The fact that a man feels his own weakness is at least some evidence that he realizes the magnitude of the work appointed him. And this gives room for hope that he will make God his counselor and his strength. Such a person will move no farther nor faster than he knows God is leading him. A man will gain power and efficiency as he accepts the responsibilities which God places upon him. And with his whole soul seeks to qualify himself to bear them aright. However humble his position or limited his ability, that individual will attain true greatness who cheerfully responds to the call of duty and, trusting to the divine strength, seeks to perform his work with fidelity. He will feel that he has a sacred commission to battle against wrong, to strengthen the right, to elevate, to comfort and bless his fellow men. Indolence, selfishness, and love of worldly approbation must yield to this high and holy calling. Engaged in such a work, the weak man will become strong, the timid, brave, the irresolute, firm, and decided. Each sees the importance of his position and his course inasmuch as heaven has chosen him to do a special work for the king of kings. Such men will leave the world better for having lived in it. Their influence is exerted to elevate, to purify, to ennoble all with whom they come in contact. And thus, they help to prepare their fellow men for the heavenly courts. And then she says, Tola governed Israel 23 years and was succeeded by Jair. The, this ruler also feared the Lord and endeavored to maintain his worship among the people. In conducting the affairs, of the government he was assisted by his sons 
who acted as magistrates and went forth, went from place to place to administer justice. Um, so, you know, here she just mentions them in this context of the type of character that's needed to be uh, effective in giving a message. And so Tola meaning a worm, I think definitely uh, fits into that context. And, and, you know, we have to, you know, we all recognize um, that the big problem that this movement has had is people who have tried to, um, well, one is they've trusted in their own wisdom and understanding. Right. And, and that's evidenced by the fact that they're unwilling to allow other people to, to share what they understand uh, they find it threatening if it differs with their ideas. And, and they always make the excuse that they're protecting God's people, but they never are by doing such things. Right? The church did it. This movement has done it. And if we believe in the truth, if we can trust God, we would act in the way that he acts because God doesn't shut down people. He doesn't... Uh, eliminate the wicked from the earth as soon as they sin. He's long-suffering, he's patient, he's merciful, he's just, and we we are not in our dealing with our fellow man. Well, right? God is also willing to reason with us. Right, and, and yeah. people are often unwilling to reason with others with whom they differ. And that's because they trust in their own wisdom and not in God's. Mm -hmm. So to me, this message in the context in which she brings it here is really an answer to this problem that exists in this movement. So maybe, maybe what we should say about this Tola and Jair is it's not so much a particular mess message. I mean, it is a message. But it's a particular type of uh, person in the movement that is characteristic of what the movement becomes after the message of Abimelech. Because after the failure, failure of July 18, we, it, it did not affect uh, humility, which was really what was needed. Um, but we have to see that after the failure of the message of Abimelech, it, it should bring about humility or it will. I think it would have to bring about humility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly. Now, of course, we see that in chapter nine, uh, you're going to have, um, as Abimelech's message is, disintegrating, let's say, um, all kinds of crazy things happening, all kinds of messages and, um, you know, connected with that, that false message. Right. But here you see in chapter 10, you see now after Abimelech has died, you have this different message. So we have now Judges raised up. Now, they're not raised up here particularly against any enemy that I know of. It doesn't mention, you know, against the Philistines or, or whatever. Though we're going to see that after uh, the death of Jair, uh, we are going to see um, uh, a, a rebellion of the God's people. And, um, and, and then, again, once again, the judgment of God, which is going to be the Philistines. Any thoughts on, on that? Well, I think, <clears throat> I think we're giving a lot of things to consider right now. I mean, at, at this point, from what you just read from Spirit of Prophecy, 
we have Jair as a judge assisted by his 30 sons. <clears throat> so you have 31 being used to ride throughout this portion of Israel to give judgments. Mm -hmm. Or just in their 30 cities. Okay, but again, we, we bring this back, or I, I'll bring this back to the 300 of the Millerites. Yeah. They do go from place to place to administer justice. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I understand the symbol of the 300, and, and it can be connected to the 30. Um, so, so we could, so, but we, we had attached 300 to the message of Gideon. Right. And Jeff did, right? Correct. And we still say that that's that's correct, but to me the thirty here represents uh, this movement in a in its whole historical uh, perspective, okay. right? From you know uh, nineteen eighty nine till uh, twenty twenty one at least, okay, and probably f further in the sense that this is an inheritance. It's the the 30 um, sons, right? So they're inheriting this symbol. So yeah, so there is a connection with the 300. Okay. There just seems to be a lot of symbols here that we've never really considered before in these in these two judges and it's interesting for the number of symbols that we're seeing just in five verses so do we have anything else in this section Well, and, and in this consideration, we know that Gilead is part of what we're talking about here. We know that one of the judges is from Manasseh. Sorry about that. And one is from Issachar. But I find it intriguing because we have Manasseh on the east, we have Manasseh on the west, and the Manasseh on the west borders on Issachar. So we're right in, right in the center of the allotment for the children of Israel. So is the placement of these two judges a symbol of the outreach of this message that's going to have to go really from the center of the message itself and i mean the the foundation of this message has always been the seven times, but the central pillar of this message has always been the 2320, or sorry, the, the 2300. So that's, that's part of what I'm looking at with this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it says in the Thank you. Chronicles. Yes. Yes, as mentions there, but is the car being man who understood the times? Yeah. Good point there. And aren't we today in this movement to understand the times? Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and that's really understanding like the calendar in that context. But that's that's also an application that we are to be understanding the chronology. Mm -hmm. That's the symbol that I would take from this. So would I. Okay, um, so just another, uh, did somebody say something? I thought I heard something said. Yeah. Anyway, um, in, in Chronicles chapter uh, 7, verse 1, so this is what I'm trying to understand, because um, it says uh, the sons of Issachar were Tola, Pua, Jeshub, Shimron, Four, right? So this Tola is um, in uh, Judges chapter ten. He's he's obviously not the same Tola, right? I would have to agree with that because he's the son of Pua, who is a son of of Issachar, right? Um, but he's also the son of Pua. Pua, who's the son of Dodo. So, you know, you're getting a lot of these names um, occurring again and again, right? I mean, people name themselves after their grandfather or their father or great-grandfather. Um, but it's interesting that we have then with this Tola and this Jair, we have these names that are, are mentioned in the past. Again, this is tying us to the past, a repeat of history, as you pointed out, Correct. Right. So that we would understand that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'd have to say the JR is a different JR than the one that's mentioned earlier. Especially since this is way later. But, um, but it is a repeat. And so Tola and JR both have this. And it's First Chronicles twelve thirty two, where the children of Issachar were, were, which were men that had understanding of the times. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam and Ashtaroth, and the gods of Syria, and the gods of Zidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord, and served not him. In this verse, the children of Israel are being represented as serving or worshiping seven different gods of the nations around them. Mm -hmm. So is this, the children of Israel are now in perfect apostasy? Since they've chosen to worship seven different gods? Well, complete, I guess, yeah. Right. So, yeah, so they got Balaam, which is a Phoenician god, Ashtaroth, you know, the god of the groves, that's from Sidonian, from Sidon. Um, and then it says, and the gods of Syria. Right. Um, and then you got the gods of Zidon. So, which it would include, so include of course, um, Ashtaroth, but because that's sort of a repetition, and the gods of Moabites, right? That's going to be um, uh, not particularly sure which gods those would be, and then the Ammonites. Well, I guess that's Hamash. Hamash is the Moabites. Yes. 
Okay. And then ammonites. Maybe Molek. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think you might be right there. And then the gods of the Philistines. So, um, but it, you know, so it puts it here where it's going to name two of the gods, Balaam and Ashtoreth, and then it's going to name the gods by city or by area. Yeah, by by area. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the situation that I'm looking at here is that here is the, the gods that are being named are of those nations that are surrounding Israel. So all of this that has encompassed Israel, they are now choosing to serve these gods rather than holding on to their own faith yeah because it states and forsook the lord and served not him okay so just another thing about this um so you, you it's listing seven different things right correct but balaam and ashtaroth are already gods of well, well, Ashtaroth is the gods of Zion, so you have the Zidonians worship Ashtaroth. Um, you got Moab is Chemosh, uh, Ammon is Molech or Milcom, and the gods of the Philistines, Dagon, of course, um, but they have other gods as well, right? Because they have uh, Beelzebub and uh, Marnus and this Berseto. Because we looked at Tercetto before, um, so this almost though is like they have two gods named, and then they have five territories or nations, right? Correct. And that's kind of a two-five combination, like the seven years of famine are divided into two and five years, as are the seven periods of two uh, from. 34 AD to 1798. Um, so what does a two and five combination represent to, to get seven? Because you can have a three, four combination to get seven, two. Well, you also have a six, one, but the six, one is six days shall you work one day to worship. Yeah. yeah. Stephen, do you have any thoughts on this two, five? Since you're the first one who who... who kind of addressed its symbolism. Yes, well, we connected it to 252 days and then 525 days. Okay. That's a 777 structure. Okay, so if we're going to try to take this this period of the, the judges, chapter 10, verse 6, um, We're, we're going to have some symbols here that actually kind of bring us back into the movement, back into an earlier history, don't they? Because could this be a repeat and enlarge upon what we've seen? I mean, so... Okay, go on. Is this a repeat and enlarge or is this a another one of these initial mentions that lays the groundwork for the repeat and enlarge. Okay, well, what I'm saying here is that um, so far when we've looked at these enemies that have survived right, that are going to be testing this movement, right? So these are the errors or messages. And then we have this internal issue with um, Abimelech and and its results. And then we have Tola and Jair. So we have now uh, a message that seems to, to bring about peace. It resolves it as uh, all the symbols of this movement. But now we have, we go on, and, and if we're going to take this uh, as following, um, I don't know if that makes sense. 
at this point. I mean, maybe it does, but from where where I sit at at the present time, I see symbol symbolism that brings us back to the period of seven hundred and seventy seven days. Um, but I'm not sure why. Maybe there's something here that can give us a clue. But these are judgments that are going to be given upon God's people for their disobedience. And, and you're going to see some, some symbols in here, such as uh, the 18 years. Um, you also have now here the seven, the list of seven uh, um, gods, but it's not particular because it's going to be a two-five combination. Two of the gods mentioned are also worshipped by these other nations, these five nations or territories that are, are mentioned. So, so you're going to have the Philistines and the Ammonites again, and you know, so maybe it is something that still follows. Maybe it's it's something that follows to for the people who reject the message of maybe it's something to do with the church now. I don't know. I'm just I'm trying to understand where we would go with this as far as when we draw it on the line. Because we haven't actually done that. We're gonna have to do that at some point. Uh place these things on the line again. Any thoughts on the two and the five again? Because because if they relate to the seven seven seven, the two fifty two and the five twenty five, as a shorthand, can we still place this as future, or do we have to go back? I'm just going to have to look at this further. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Because I don't have a direct answer at this point. So in this situation, we see that the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the children of Ammon. When he is selling them into the hands of the Philistines and the children of Ammon, he's selling them to the nations that are to the east and to the west. Yeah. Basically dividing the country. Because we understand that the Philistines were on the on the very west coast of Israel. And we understand that the Ammonites were on the east coast more by the allotments of Gad and Reuben. Yeah. Yeah, so they're on two different extremes, east and west. Okay. Now, this, this next verse has something very specific. And that year they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel. Eighteen years, all the children of Israel that were on the other side of the Jordan in the land of the Am Amorites, which is in Gilead. First, it's in Judges 10, 7, we're referencing the Ammonites. And in Judges 10, 8, we're now referencing the Ammonites. Amor Am Amorites, sorry. But we have that year they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel. 
it says that year and then 18 years. So did this go on for one year and then 18 years or did it just go on for the 18 years? 18 years. I mean, if it was, if it was the combination of the two, we have 19 years, which we have also show, showing up in, in Isaiah. Yeah, but it, it, the Hebrew expression wouldn't mean 19 years. Okay. Right. So um, now I just want to look at one other thing, too, here, just uh, I'm kind of going back a bit. Um, but you're going to have this... Um, let's see here. In chapter 12, um, verse 9, because this is going to be later on, but um, it's talking about uh, Ibzan of Bethlehem, who judged Israel. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters. All right. Abroad and took in 30 daughters from abroad for his sons. And he judged Israel seven years. Um, so... It's kind of interesting here because this is 30, 30, and 30 again. Right. Right. So 30 sons, 30 daughters, and 30 uh, daughters-in-law. Um, so we'll probably get to that at some point, but I just thought it was an interesting parallel. Um, now, just going back, though, to uh, Judges 10, um, so I know sometimes just the way it's, um, you know, the way English is, the way language is, you know, we could get the impression that this is, um, so they're going to crush them that year, right? But it's going to be 18 years altogether. So it's just saying at that time that they're going to begin to do this. Okay. Okay. So you wouldn't add that year to the 18 years. It's just it's just an, a way of saying things. Um, um, another way you could say is in the, that same year that those people destroyed the Israelites who lived on the east side of the Jordan in the area of Gilead, that is the land where the Amorites had lived, the Israelites suffered for 18 years. That's one translation. So it's just going to say that it's giving you the starting point. Sorry about that. Gives you the starting point, and then it just tells you how long that period is. Okay. Um, Okay, Daniel, your mic is really noisy. We don't, if you're trying to say something, we can't hear any words, just uh, noise. Okay, now. And then you have the question of the Ammonites and the Amorites. Correct. But given our time today, okay. we're going to come back to this section on Sunday. Okay. We're going to look to cover these verses again a little bit more in depth and then proceed in the rest of the of the study. Now, is there anything else that we need to address, any other question or comment that we should approach today? All right. Shall we then close the study with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, as we see the weakness of those that have gone before us, help us so that we will rely more fully upon you, that we will learn the lesson that we are being shown that only full reliance upon you, seeing our total 
unworthiness. And that only through you can we gain proper strength and proper judgment. Help us to learn these lessons. Help us to hold on to these lessons and be prepared for that which you would have us to do. We thank you for this day that is before us and for some for the day that is now behind us. Guide us and direct us. Bring us again together so that we may continue to consider these lessons and these symbols that are being presented. Help us to this end. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.